Welcome to the NWATC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Underwood, and I'm going to turn it over to Christian Ramers to introduce our guest. Thanks, Kent. It's my pleasure to introduce Sharisha Danaretti, Associate Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases Department of Medicine. She's going to talk about a subject which has gained steam, really, in the last three or four years, I would say, which is prevention with positives. Go ahead, Sharisha. Great. I had been giving this talk for one of our University of Washington graduate classes for years without a whole lot to say except in the realm of behavioral uh, research, but lately there's been a lot more to say about it. And In our, my first overview slide, I just kind of want to talk about prevention in general, and some of these topics have actually been touched upon in different um, uh, echo sessions, and namely with Jared Baton talking about pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I'm not really going to go into <laughs> that topic, which is a, can take over an hour to just go into the itself. Um, but prior to exposure, we think about behavioral changes, vaccines, obviously vaccine development has not been um, all that successful to date. Uh, and then some other preventative strategies like needle exchange and then um, STI treatment and circumcision, which we'll talk about a little bit about. At the time of trans uh, transmission, condoms, and then I'll talk a little bit about microbicides. And uh, of course, antiretroviral therapy for mother to child, which I'm not going to go into great detail about. And then uh, some things like serosorting, sorting, which if you haven't heard of, I'll talk a little bit about today. And then the testing and treating strategy. So using antiretroviral therapy in positive individuals to prevent transmission to their negative partners. And then uh, some other resources there. So this is a slide from a Tom Quinn that I think has been shown in a lot of other prevention talks as well that kind of shows you the, the effect of various different in interventions and, uh, from different studies that have been conducted. Number one on that list is treatment for prevention. As you can see, that by far has the biggest effect. And I'll go into the study that really has shown this, a um, multinational study that has shown this uh, to be really the biggest prevention strategy with positives. And then, uh, as Dr. Baton talked about in an earlier session, ECHO session, PrEP for discordant couples in the partner study, which he is the uh, principal author on, and then as well as some other studies uh, looking at um, PrEP in heterosexuals. And then medical male circumcision, which has been a, a topic that has really been discussed for more than a decade now in terms of HIV prevention, and looking at the effect size of that more on the order of 54% rather than the 96% that we see with treatment. And then PrEP for MSM, which we know from the IPREX study, which I won't go into great detail about, a little bit lower of an effect size thought to be due to adherence issues. And then some of the other things like STI treatment in this one study, however, we know that other studies have not shown the same benefit of treatment, for instance, of HSV co-infection. Uh, co and then microbicides, which I'll talk a little bit about, which have been an originally promising with this Caprice study, and unfortunately more recent studies have not borne out the same results. And then, I, as I mentioned, the HIV vaccine studies, which have not been positive except for this Thai uh, study that which showed some modest benefit in uh, moderate to low risk individuals. Okay, so we what we know about transmission of HIV and uh, from positive to negative individuals is really that the viral load matters, which is why antiretroviral therapy is so important for treatment of the individual, not only for their own health but also to risk to decrease the risk of transmission to others. And this was a, a very famous study by Tom Quinn also that showed that direct association between viral load and risk of transmission um, to the uninfected partner. So, as I mentioned, ART for prevention. This is the big topic as we move towards treating everybody and testing and treating everybody. This is probably going to be our biggest impact in terms of preventative strategies, as you can see from that first overview slide. So this uh, is uh, the main study that has been uh, that has come out for ART for prevention. There's two of them. This is the randomized control trial that really looked at it. Um, the HIV Prevention Trials Network 052 study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, and which has been brought up at various echo sessions, um, uh, really looking at uh, data for. Uh, offering treatment to patients, particularly in serodiscordant couples. So this study involved almost 2,000 serodiscordant HIV and uh, couples, serodiscordant for HIV, at a number of sites. There were uh, very few from the U.S., mostly from Africa and Asia. 
13 sites in total, and they looked at uh, individuals who didn't really meet the ther criteria for treatment uh, otherwise by WHO criteria of relatively high CD4 counts with 350 to 550. Uh, of course, they all received the usual counseling. And um, there was also genetic analysis to uh, make sure that the transmissions that did occur were linked transmissions, as people do have partnerships outside of their, um, of their um, married couple or their stable partner. So what did it show? This is uh, why we saw this, uh, why I showed you the 96% reduction. There was only one linked transmission in people that were offered therapy early, meaning uh, the higher through CD4 count threshold w versus waiting until their CD4 counts dropped. And as you can see, there was one transmission versus 27 linked transmissions. And not only was there a benefit for uh, decreased transmission, there was also a benefit to the person getting HIV therapy in, this, in, in that their health was overall improved. Namely, there was less risk of TB infection, particularly in TB endemic areas. So not only a direct benefit to the patient, but also to their serodiscordant partner. Similarly, there was a, a study by Deborah Donnell and uh, Jared Baton that showed in, um, in their HSV2, uh, HSV, HIV co-infected study, uh, the partner study that showed that uh, treating people with ART did show uh, a significant reduction in uh, transmission to their negative partner, again, on the order of greater than 90%, as in this study. So the conclusion is that early initiation of antiretroviral therapy reduced the rates of sexual transmission and clinical events uh, so, uh, such as TB, indicating both the personal and public health benefits for therapy. So this really moved into the realm of why we want to treat everybody, and not only for the direct benefits of the patient, but also from a population level and um, to decrease HIV rates uh, as a whole. So. We know that treatment is good. We want to get everybody on treatment. So what are the other modalities that could add to this um, uh, strategy? And so people are looking at more than just one strategy. For instance, in particularly resource-limited areas where there may not be readily available access to ART, what are some other strategies that have been implemented? This is a picture from uh, the UNAIDS uh, website that shows uh, an area in Africa where they're doing medical male circumcisions um, to prevent transmission of HIV. So there have been a few studies, and I'm not going to go to them in great detail, but there have been three large studies so far, mainly in Africa, in Kenya, South Africa, and Uganda, that have looked at um, men who are um, uh, HIV negative, that, uh, and greater than 10,000 of, the, of these men. And what they found is that, and all of, all of these had, were described as heterosexuals, decreased, um, so circumcision decreased the male heterosexual HIV acquisition by 50 to 60 percent. And the longer they were out from the circumcision, the greater the benefit. Um, and the, unfortunately, there's not the same level of data in MSM uh, populations. And definitely not in this country is there data to, um, that suggests the same level of protection. However, I wanted to bring this up because three days ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a, a, a policy statement on circumcision that has caused a little bit of a, a stir in the U.S. about um, about circumcision, and because there are very mixed beliefs on this, and and um, but for the first time, they're really. Uh, saying that the benefits are enough to justify that this procedure be available to families if they so choose. And this allows people who haven't been able to pay for it um, to uh, have the, for them to have access to this procedure if they so want. It does go into the fact that um, some families will choose to not do it, and this is a discussion that will need to be had with providers and, their fam and the uh, patient's family. Uh, about the risks and benefits of the procedure. The main benefits that they're alluding to are the, the benefits of um, not only HIV transmission but other STD uh, risks as well. And mainly, as I mentioned, the data is not from within the U.S., which is one of the issues of controversy with this statement. So just because this might be on the radar for people who take care of, of kids that maybe more people will be asking about it um, in your practice. So vaginal microbicides. So uh, this is uh, 
an area that unfortunately has initially had a great uh, level of enthusiasm about, um, about it, and unfortunately in subsequent large trials have not really borne out to be the success that we had hoped. So why, why are vaginal microbicides of interest? Well, uh, we know that uh, for women, uh, this can be a great tool for use in preventing HIV. Uh, it, what we have now currently, the, the study that I alluded to before, Caprisa, was with tenofovir uh, microbicide gel. Good safety profile, rapid absorption, long half-life, low systemic absorption, and there's evidence in animal studies that it was good at preventing SIV. So this, these are slides from David, <laughs> nice pictures that show how HIV enters into the mucosal surface, and what the tenofovir gel does is essentially provide this protective layer of, uh, uh, to not allow HIV to really enter the cell. So the Caprisa study, which came out in 2010 and published in Science, um, was a randomized placebo-controlled trial uh, that was conducted in Africa in, in mainly young women who were sexually active high risk but not HIV infected, um, and what they had to do was either they would apply the gel before sex or immediately after sex. Um, and they followed up with uh, 30 months in this, and they either got the gel or placebo. And what they found was that there was a 39% reduction of HIV incident rates in those in, uh, women that used the tenofovir gel versus placebo. Um, and uh, and as with the IPREX study, which Dr. Baton had talked about, really the efficacy related to adherence, which is going to be the issue with a lot of our prevention um, uh, interventions, is that if they don't take the medication, it's not going to work. And that's what you see here, that for high adherers, there was over a 50% reduction versus the low adherers, where there was uh, only a 28% uh, reduction. Um, what I talked about before with the, um, the other studies that have come out since that time, so there was the FEMPREP study, which was stopped early due to lack of efficacy, and now also the VOICE study, which is also a microbicide study that was also stopped due to lack of efficacy. But that also included a tenofovir and Truvada arm, um, same as FEMPREP. And it doesn't seem that those, um, that in women in those studies, that PrEP really worked well. And there are a lot of uh, theories as to why that is. Likely adherence plays a big factor in the lack of efficacy. So conclusion from the, from the Caprisa study was that tenofovir gel can reduce HIV incident rates and HIV acquisition if used. And lastly, I just wanted to go through what we can do on a daily basis in our clinic um, uh, for those who we already take care of that are positive and really prevention messages, which I think should be part of our routine health uh, care. So incorporating prevention into care, there's actually a lot of um, uh, literature around this and there's even a whole curriculum called Prevention with Positives and Ask Screen Intervene. And this, some of these slides are from there. So, one of the main things is that every HIV transmission event involves somebody who's already infected, and hopefully that person is in care. And while they're in care, we can provide the, the information and hopefully the uh, knowledge that they could use to change their behaviors to decrease uh, prevention to their partners. So prevention counseling focused on risk reduction. We want to incorporate risk reduction um, counseling into all of our visits about STD counseling, uh, drug and alcohol, which can also facilitate high-risk behaviors. And we want to do that risk assessment really every time the patient comes in, if possible, for their routine health care. Um, acknowledge and support steps if they're already positive, uh, positive steps that they've already made. And one of the things that I always tell students and residents that uh, rotate in the clinic is to really try to avoid being judgmental because patients aren't going to tell you that they're doing risky behavior if they don't trust you or they don't feel comfortable telling you about this behavior. And then there are some real misconceptions about uh, HIV uh, and risk. Christian was just telling me at the IAS conference that someone stood up and said, oh, well, now that we ha use ART for prevention, that means we don't have to use condoms anymore, right? And that could really change the sexual practices amongst MSM in our community if they think, oh, well, I'm, I'm already on ART. I don't need to, 
to use condoms now. So really trying to make sure that patients understand that there's still risks involved. And then um, and this is basically just talking with your patients and coming up with plans for safer behavior. Uh, and of course, not everything works for every patient. And so we really need to be flexible and think about what works for our patients. And that's what we kind of focus on in our echo sessions anyway. So one of the, some of the other things that I'll briefly touch on here are disclosure. You want to make sure that patients are disclosing their HIV status to their sexual partners. That's really, really critical. There are some other things that patients do um, that, um, like zero sorting, meaning that they, only, they tell you that they're only having sex with other HIV-infected individuals to re uh, reduce the risk of spreading it to non-HIV-infected individuals. However, there is some problem with that because sometimes it's called zero guessing because you don't know. And some patients say, well, I was in a bathhouse having sex, and I just assumed that my partner, the person I had sex with, was positive because why else would they be in a bathhouse having sex? Whereas someone I'll see for PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, who was in a bathhouse and subsequently found out that they had sex with someone who's positive, says, well, I just assumed that they would tell me if they're positive. So clearly some misconceptions on both sides. And then there's also seropositioning, knowing that if you're a receptive partner, there's a higher risk. So if you're positive, you being only the, ins uh, um, or being the receptive partner and the negative person being the insertive partner. Obviously, these are not... Uh, these are not 100% efficacious, eff efficacious, and there's still transmission that occurs. So zero sorting, just some data about that, um, that it is an imperfect strategy, partly because there's the lack of knowledge about someone's status and may not be disclosing their status, uh, or they may not even know that they have HIV. They may have acute or be in the acute phase of infection or not have been tested. And so really, it's an imperfect strategy, and it doesn't prevent other um, bacterial STDs. So just to summarize, just some briefly, there are a lot of tools that we can use for prevention. I think the main thing to come away from is that antiretroviral therapy is really a pro uh, the key prevention tool uh, in our armamentarium. But there, alongside that, we should still be doing um, counseling and uh, assessing for need for behavioral changes, and then um, possibly circumcision, and uh, maybe microbicides in the past for prevention. All right, thank you.